Hey Drew, religion was only made up to control people. It's false. No way. Not this time. Not this time. No. Not this time. It never happened. It never happened. Wrong. Not this time. Not this time. You're wrong. No way. We got you. Not a chance. Being a full-time atheist activist, I hear atheists talk about religion every single day. That discourse is of varying quality, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Being in the position I'm in, I try my hardest to set a good example for others so that those watching my videos might engage in more constructive discourse and less destructive discourse. This video is part of my efforts to set a good example and encourage constructive discourse. Of course, as I discuss what atheists should and shouldn't say, know that I'm not implying that all atheists say these things. I'm not trying to make generalizations here. Sometimes some atheists, agnostics, non-believers, etc. say some of these things, and I'm just here explaining why no one should say them at all. Religion is a mental illness. Saying this shows both ignorance and insensitivity. We'll focus on the ignorance first. The diagnostic manual used by the American Psychological Association, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM-5, lays out five criteria for mental disorders. Let's take a look at them one at a time and see how religion fits each. One, a behavioral or psychological syndrome or pattern that occurs in an individual. Sure, each religion brings along some of its own behavioral patterns. Religion fits this criteria. 2. Reflects an underlying psychobiological dysfunction. No, religious people have not been shown to typically have neurochemical dysfunctions caused by or associated with their religion exclusively. Religion doesn't fit this criteria. 3. The consequences of which are significant distress or disability. Someone's religion can definitely cause them clinically significant distress or create patterns of behavior that are debilitating. However, this is not required of religion at all. One can be religious without being significantly distressed or impaired. Religion doesn't fit this criteria. 4. Must not be merely an expected response to common stressors and losses, example, the loss of a loved one, or a culturally sanctioned response to a particular event, example, trance states in religious rituals. So, the DSM-5 actually spells out that altered states resulting from religious rituals, especially when culturally sanctioned, are not to be considered symptoms of a disorder. Religious thinking and behavior usually is an expected culturally sanctioned response to certain events. Religion doesn't fit this criteria. 5. Primarily a result of social deviance or conflicts with society. Religious thoughts and actions can conflict with society, but it isn't required in the least. In fact, being religious is often a result of social conformity. Religion does not fit this criteria. So most of these criteria aren't met. Those who say religion is a mental illness show that they don't actually understand how clinicians define mental illness. They're just wrong. Now to address the insensitivity at work here. The intent behind calling religion a mental illness is often to call religious people mentally deficient. It's a pejorative. Beyond being an ignorant and baseless insult, this rhetoric encourages the stigmatization of mental illness. In preparation for this video, I consulted my friend Shannon Q on this subject, and she put her objection to this statement so well that I've asked her to come on and just make the point herself. This approach is perpetuating the stigmatization of mental health issues. When bandied about as a pejorative, the pre-existing stigma and misunderstanding of the areas surrounding mental health perpetuate, strengthening their entrenchment and continuing to distance us all from better education and understanding. If we call ourselves skeptics and inquisitors who love science and act in this manner, we undermine our own goals. If we call ourselves humanists, we should take pause in order to recognize that what we are actually doing is weaponizing an unhealthy and inaccurate stigma in the hopes of harming another under its weight while simultaneously sacrificing those who are involuntarily bearing that weight already. Religion was invented to control people. I'm sure you've heard the saying attributed to Mark Twain, religion was invented when the first con man met the first fool. Maybe Mark Twain, in his relatively limited access to information as compared to us, had an excuse for making such an ignorant statement, but we don't. This idea makes two huge mistakes. One, it reduces religion to something far simpler and more monolithic than it actually is. And two, it ignores what we know about the psychology and ancient history of religion. Religion can be and often is used to control people. Anyone who knows anything about prosperity gospel preachers, cult leaders, or religious governments can tell you that. 
That's not all it does or can be used for, though. Religion is broad, variable, and hard to define. Many traditions vary wildly from others. Some easily lend themselves to controlling groups of many to serve a privileged few, while others depend on fierce individualism. The fact that many people practice traditions like certain forms of paganism, Buddhism, and Unitarianism that don't lend themselves to being easily controlled en masse points to the conclusion that religion is more than a tool for control. Now, to clarify, I do think it's fair to examine the history and composition of a religion for signs of intentional design for the purpose of control. I think one could easily make the case that Islam, for example, was created by ancient Arab patriarchs for the express purpose of uniting previously diverse people groups and then gaining and maintaining power over them. However, I don't think all traditions show such signs of total design. Many, I think, have a more complex origin story. Religions don't just change when their originators or leaders make it so. They also change as everyday people practice them just a little differently over generations. Some of those little changes are naturally selected for by the pressures of the changing world, and those changes eventually pile up, resulting in huge changes over time. Basically, religions evolve. Their features can exist for the sole reason that they help propagate and preserve the faith. No intent behind them required. What really drives home the point that religion wasn't just invented to control people is the fact that religion seems to be at least as old as humanity itself. There's evidence that over 100,000 years ago, humans in the Middle East were already ritually burying the dead along with valuable stones and tools. Hunter-gatherers that still exist in remote places today, without much exception, practice some sort of religious tradition, suggesting that religion has been with us since our beginning. Religion simply seems to be a thing that most humans do naturally. We wouldn't expect for religion to be so ancient and universal if its existence was dependent upon a crafty creator in all cases. So please don't embarrass yourself or your fellow atheists by asserting that religion was just made up to control people. The definition of faith is... I feel like this is what I might get the most pushback on in this video. Let me paint a picture of a common interaction I've seen between primarily Christians and atheists, which I think is problematic. An atheist asserts that having faith is not a reliable way to determine truth. A Christian says it can be in some instances. The atheist says that believing something without evidence, or having faith, is irrational to which the Christian responds that they don't have that kind of faith, and that they define faith as trust based on prior experience or action. The atheist explains that the Christian doesn't actually have faith then, but trust. The Christian says, no, I do have faith, to which the atheist replies, oh, so you admit that you believe things without evidence? I know that scenario seems to paint the atheist rather uncharitably, but I have seen that exact conversation play out a few times. Here's what's going wrong there. The atheist in that scenario is holding to a rigid definition of faith, assuming and asserting that it can have only one meaning. The reality is, faith means very different things to different people. Plenty of religious people do essentially define faith as belief without evidence or belief that is justified by its mere existence without outside justification. I understand why atheists, especially in the US, often define faith that way too. But other religious people have different definitions. So if we're talking to a religious person and they bring up faith, we have to understand what they mean by that before engaging them on it. There are two major ways I see to undermine constructive discourse on faith. The first is to refrain from asking any clarifying questions about your interlocutor's definition of the term, and the other is to assert that their definition of the term is simply wrong while yours is correct. I shouldn't have to say this, but words don't have intrinsic meanings. It's entirely possible for two or more people to operate upon a working definition of a word for the sake of progress within a conversation. So my suggested course of action for when faith comes up in a conversation is to do that. Ask your interlocutor's definition, and then collaborate on a working definition of the word so you can move forward. If you're in a conversation about why someone believes in a deity and they bring up faith as a reason for belief, it it may even be best to use their definition rather than your own. From there, you can discuss if their faith is a reliable path to truth. I'll leave this point with an example from one of Anthony Magna Bosco's street epistemology videos. Okay, how about you, Daniel? What's, what's that main reason why you think it's true? Uh, you know, it all boils down to faith. What do you, what's your definition of faith? Faith would be uh, an unhindered belief in something. Uh, just having that 100% confidence, like you said, just being completely sure, uh, despite uh, 
despite opposing viewpoints. Oh, okay. You just believe in God because... You know what they say, when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. And yeah, that's exactly what happens when an atheist just assumes why a theist believes. They make themselves look ignorant and arrogant while making me and other atheists look that way too. Yes, there are plenty of common reasons why theists believe the way they do. Plenty of people will say it's just the way they were raised, they had a personal experience within a certain religion, that it helps them emotionally, etc. Understanding those trends, however, does not make it reasonable to assert why an individual believes what they do when you haven't asked them or familiarized yourself with their past statements on the subject. I made a video a while back called Why Theists Can't Convert Atheists, and my main point there was that theists often have a hard time getting through to atheists because a lot of them refuse to listen to why atheists don't believe in the first place. So if you want to get through to or even have a decent conversation with a theist, don't just turn the tables. If you don't want someone unfairly coming at you and saying, you're just an atheist because you just want to sin, then don't be unfair to theists by saying something like, oh, you only believe in God because you're too scared to accept the truth. Seriously, just ask someone why they believe and then listen intently before asserting anything about their reasoning. It's sad that this even needs to be said, but it's so easy for people to fall into tribalism that I guess constant reminders are necessary to keep people aware of the fact that when they don't know something while talking to someone with whom they disagree, the most intellectually honest thing to do is admit it and try to ask good questions to figure it out. Even if a theist assumes and asserts things about you, it isn't okay to do the same to them. Set an example for them to follow. Go about discourse honestly and charitably, and a surprising number of people will reciprocate. If someone doesn't, consider just moving on or engaging simply to show them and others that atheists can be kind and cool-headed like anyone else. Seeing people do that when I first became an atheist showed me that the atheist community wasn't nasty and depraved as I had been taught as a Christian. Well, I hope no one was too upset by this, and I'm interested to see what the atheist community has to say in response. I care about these conversations and about the atheist community being a place where people can find reliable information and constructive dialogue on the topic of religion. Criticizing some of my own peers is necessary to the achievement of those goals, and I hope my atheist viewers understand that. If you haven't already, I hope you'll join me in trying to set an example that, if followed, would inspire positive change and constructive discourse within the atheist community and beyond. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. As always, go ahead and subscribe, check out my Patreon, follow me on Twitter and Facebook at GM Skeptic, join my Discord, and until next time, stay skeptical.